Hello, everyone. I am so happy to see so many incredible faces here this evening. I am Shane. I am from Left Bank Books. And it is such a pleasure to have Jason here this evening. And I want to thank you all for being here this evening. If you are watching virtually, which I don't actually know where the cameras are. Uh, oh, there's the camera. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the event. So I will be helping with that as well. So for everyone joining us, both here and virtually, wherever you are in the world, we thank you so much for your support. If you are watching from here, we have books available for sale in the lobby. And if you're watching virtually, you can buy them on our website, left-bank.com. And now I would love to introduce Rabbi Susan Talby. Thank you, Shane. Um, as I was coming here tonight, um, I was, I, an image came to my, into my heart. It's the image from Song of Songs um, that says, always look for the Shoshana ben HaKochim. Look for the rose or the lily among the thorns. And we are living in thorny times, my friends. Thorny times, but here tonight, we have the lily. Here tonight, we have, um, you know, Left Bank Books, one of the great gems of St. Louis, partnering um, humbly with CRC. We're always so grateful to do this together. And look who we have. We have a poet. We have St. Louis's own poet, Jason Summer. You know, talk about how we wrap truth with beauty. Only the poets really know how to do that. And we also have another gem of St. Louis here with us tonight, Dan Rich. Dan has been keeping us on that path of truth in a wonderful, loving way for a very long time in, on so many arenas. So it is really a privilege to be here with all of you tonight. And my, my, my beautiful thing that I wrote didn't come out, <laughs> and I didn't check it. So I also um, would like to say that CRC is participating in a national pilot program um, um, that this program is a part of. It's called Act Against Anti-Semitism, and it's led and supported by the Anti-Defamation League and the Union of Reform Judaism. Um, and they've come together to and they chose like 30 congregations, I think, across the country to participate not just in learning, but in activism, in advocacy, um, in, in facing uh, anti-Semitism. And, and so much of that is in telling the stories, telling the stories so we don't make the same mistakes, telling the stories so that we can learn from the past. Did anybody hear NPR on the way here tonight, hear uh, George Bush talk about Georgia? and Putin's um, incursion into Georgia, and the words were the same, and, and John McCain saying, watch for Ukraine. You know, we, we can learn. We can learn, and this program is trying to tell us not only are we supposed to learn from the past, but we're supposed to take that learning and do something with it. So with anti-Semitism, along with many forms of hate on the rise, we recognize that like all systems of oppression, Anti-Semitism is more than the sum of interpersonal prejudice and isolated violent incidents. And by anti-Semitism weakens trust in our de democratic institutions and our elected leadership, and therefore weakens democracy. When conspiracy theories about government abound and the Jewish community serves as a convenient scapegoat, it's difficult to have a government with accountability. Anti-Semitism manifests in many forms in our society and is constantly morphing to adapt to new circumstances. Additionally, we recognize that many Jews experience multiple systems of oppression, including anti-LGBTQ plus bias, misogyny, anti-immigrant bias, and ableism. So it is our intention, being part of this program and 
sponsoring this program tonight as part of that to make sure that when we do our work, we remember that we must ensure that we are creating safe spaces, not just for some, but for all. So tonight, we will hear Jason Summer in conversation with Dan Rich. And let me make sure I don't miss anything. And I'll pull this up correctly. My friend Dan Rich received a master's degree in art history from the University of Maryland, College Park, and continued doctoral studies at the University of Chicago, also in art history. Dan served as the head of adult public programs in the education department of St. Louis Art Museum from 1986 to 1999. Boy, you've been here a long time. In 2000, he accepted a position at the St. Louis Holocaust Museum and Learning Center in memory of Gloria M. Goldstein, where he served as curator and director of education until his recent retirement in October of 2021. So now he has time to do fun things like this. In 2009, Dan was recognized in the field of education by the Jewish Professional Organization of St. Louis, and he received the 2010 Fred A. Goldstein Memorial Service Award for Outstanding Leadership, presented by the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. He's a great teacher, he's a mensch, and he's a good friend. Jason Summer, I'm proud to say, with his family, are members of this congregation. We claim you, which is, you know, a feather in our cap. We love the poets. He's the author of five poetry collections, most recently, Portalands, in the University of Chicago's Phoenix Poets Series. He's been recognized with an Anna Davidson Rosenberg Award for poems about the Jewish experience and read from his work at the National Holocaust Memorial Program, Museum's program, Speech and Silence, Poetry and the Holocaust. A former Stanford University Stegner Fellow, Jason has held a Whiting Foundation Writers Fellowship as well as fellowships from the Breadloaf and Suwani Writers Conferences. With Hongling Zhang, he has published collaborative book-length translations of Chinese fiction, Wang in Love and Bondage, three novellas by Wang Chilbo. Is that right? How do you say it? Chilbo, I think. Chilbo. The Hongling usually opens up. And The Bathing Women, I can do that one, by, oh, here we go, Teening, good, okay, which was long listed uh, for the Man Asian Literary Prize. Jason lives right here with his family, his beautiful family in St. Louis, Missouri. So tonight we're going to hear not from his poetry collection, but a memoir that reads like poetry, I must say. Shmuel's Bridge, um, following the tracks to Auschwitz with my survivor father, is, as you'll come to hear tonight, a very moving memoir of a son's relationship with his survivor father and their Eastern European journey through a family history of unspeakable loss. We'll hear about uh, Jason's father, Jay. Um, we'll hear about their trip. And we will come to understand that Shmuel's Bridge shows history through a double lens, the memories of a growing son's complex relationship with his father, and the meditations of that son who now grown finds himself caring for a man losing all connection to the past that we know must not be forgotten. I can't remember what I wrote um, at the end of my introduction here, but I, I know that I was thinking about the teaching that says, gosh, why, if we are capable of such terrible things, why were human beings created, the rabbis asked. And the answer, because God loves stories. And this, friends, is a story that I believe God would love. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Shane, and Left Bank Books, and um, welcome to CRC. It's amazing to see people in person again.
just an addenda, not a correction, but uh, the museum where I was for 20 plus years until last October has a name change. It's now the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. And with the new name, uh, there's going to be a greatly expanded museum. So that will have its opening late summer of this year. So come back and, and see the museum. It's going to be quite different, quite expanded, and quite wonderful. So <laughs> lots to talk about in Schmuel's Bridge, uh, but it's, it's about your family. So let's talk a little bit about your family. I know from my experience, and certainly you know firsthand, that being a 2G, a second generation, a child of survivors, one or two, <clears throat> has implications. Uh, survivors can be loving, wonderful parents. There's almost always something, a, an overcompensation, uh, an overcompensation expected from, from the child, from everyone who was lost, or overprotected, all kinds of issues. So if you could say something about your family dynamic, because it's really part of the family dynamic that leads you to go on this journey. True. I feel like I should be lying down for this somehow. I know no, you're you going to talk about no. this for the evening. Um, <laughs> my family had a, a particular configuration in that my mother was American born, but gave herself entirely to my father's story. Um, pr uh, promoting it is not quite the, the right word, but, but moving aside for it. I know nearly nothing about my mother and my mother's family who were pogrom survivors. I, I knew them by their uh, fearfulness more than any particulars of the, of the story and some references. So that my father's story was the family story. And we were expected uh, at least to hear it. And I also had a family, uh, the closest relatives, my uncle and aunt, uh, my uncle by blood, my aunt uh, by marriage. My aunt was a uh, Holocaust survivor as well, an Auschwitz survivor. So I had the contrasting, um, it, it, a contrast in this sense that my father always talked about it and sought after a while uh, reasons to speak about it, uh, feeling a sense of mission almost. Um, well, not no almost about it, a sense of mission and my aunt would have no speech about the Holocaust in her presence and, it, and enforced it with uh, angry silencing. Um, so there was lots going on in, in, in the family about the Holocaust and one's majority, my own majority, came with the ability to hear and understand the stories. Stories that I first um, just got bits and pieces of, wasn't judged old enough, um, oddly enough, my uh, I got a sort of historical view of the Holocaust before I got the specifics of my family uh, placement in it. And my family's Holocaust was the Hungarian Holocaust, the Hungarian wing of the Holocaust, um, which was later, though more uh, severe in, a, in a, a brief amount of time, yeah, almost 500,000 people killed in uh, four weeks of summer or eight weeks of summer in 1944. Your Aunt Lily did start to talk more. Yes, she did. I have a, an account in the book, which I will not read now, but you know, the book's for sale. Okay. Um, uh, where surprisingly, uh, part of the book is a quest to find the exact spot where my uh, father's youngest brother, uh, Shmuel, of the title, um, tried to escape from a a transport to Auschwitz, um, and uh, it turns out at family, at thank, it was Thanksgiving where I decided that um, I, I had been doing some research to try to find the spot where he died, and the time and the place, and uh, as if to fix that in, in, with some kind of certainty meant something Im Im important. Um, and my aunt at Thanksgiving dinner, quite shockingly, said, I was there. I was on the transport. I was on the same train. And no one knew it at the table. What was even more surprising to me was that no one said anything. You know, I was 
aghast. And I, I sort of went after her and said, well, what, you know, what was it, what was it, what was it, when was it? And she just said, I didn't see the thing itself. There was shooting. The, the escape attempt was a, another car. I, I remember always, no one thing happened I could tell from where I was. She just didn't know. She also talked about the difference between a, a woman's experience and a man's experience of, of the Holocaust, which, about which a lot has been written since. But she was talking about holding rags outside of the window of the Karlsruhe freight car to get water, uh, because there was no water in their, their car to to get water to drink through squeezing out rags. And it was another one of those exper experiences where I was trying to find something from them. Um, and I was, I met with how, how easy my life was and how hard theirs, <laughs> theirs were. And, and why the etiquette around them was you shut up and waited for them to speak and let them say what they were going to say and, not, and didn't press them for anything else. So when I first met you some years ago, it was at uh, a poetry reading that you did, co-sponsored by the museum in Brodsky Library. Right, oh yeah. And uh, there too. it was very powerful where you t wrote about the Holocaust and many facets of that and read, and it came through in your poetry. Now this is your first yes. book of prose, this memoir? Yes. Uh, what are some of the differences? And in a way, I'm thinking of this as leading to the reading. Right, I'll read, I'll read a, a Because it's an example of there is that poem, and it's written about. And I love the chapter headings of yeah. each, which were all taken from poems, that then set a tone and then continued in the, uh, in the prose. So pro poetry then, prose now, but not so separated. N no. Uh, in panic last night, as I was timing out what I thought I was going to be able to read today, I discovered how much longer prose is than poetry. Um, and uh, I have, you know, unashamedly stripped out parts of poems and inserted them in here, because I write narrative poems. And, you know, one of the reasons that there are little quotations at the head of every chapter is that in case this book should also stimulate sales of, of my poetry book. You know. um, so uh, so I, I, I was just discovering how, again, what I've always really known, how compressed poetry is and how, um, you know, expansive prose is, how much more you get a chance to explain, which is my tendency even, my fault, let us say, in poems too, that I, I, I have, I make plenty of space for discourse. They aren't short, and they're mostly narrative. So, um, yeah, I was, I impressed myself again last night with the difference, you know. Um, but with prose, you have, to, you have to sort of create the world. Um, you don't hint at it. You know, the furniture is there. Uh, and sometimes the furniture is important. It was an, it was an entirely uh, engrossing experience to write the book. Uh, it was very interesting and very different than writing, writing poetry. Over a period of over a period of time? Oh, this took me about a, a year and a, a year and a half nearly. Um, but unlike poetry, I actually had something at the end of each day. Often with poems, I write 10 lines and then I subtract eight, and then I go back the next day, and then I subtract those two that are left, and I get the math right, and then I start again. Um, but here I actually, it, it was a, a song of accretion rather than of subtraction, really. Do you want to read an excerpt? Yes, I, I will. This is, um, with apologies for, for those of you who, who know the poem well, it's a, a section I think of as covering the, the material in a poem called Gunga Din, uh, not this Kipling poem, <laughs> but a poem of mine called Gunga Din. It, uh, it takes place in the book. It's a recollection while I'm on the way to um, my father, back to Budapest after we'd been to Auschwitz together. Uh, the, the method, aside from research of the book, um, or the method of the journey really, was to, to, to find the bridge, was simply to follow the tracks to Auschwitz, which got complicated for, for various reasons. There were, there were several routes um, to Auschwitz, and 
Some research had to be done as well, but this is on the way back because I don't want to spoil the climax of the book. Um, and yeah, I won't tell you anything about the big ones. Um, I'm on my way back to Budapest and my father has not taken me to his main camp, which was a labor camp outside of Budapest called Chepel. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering why he's delaying and I'm thinking about the man that he has charged me to write about, uh, a water carrier, hence the name Gunga Din. He was nicknamed by the laborers, by the slave laborers, by the forced laborers. They called him Gunga Din. And um, my father at one point says to me, I write about him. Um, you know about Gunga Din, the man we called that in Chepel? He carried water for us at, for, at forced labor. This is back in, it's a recollection, it's back in New Rochelle, New York. Um, I knew he hadn't meant the literary character, but the man from the camp. He went on, you write sometimes from stories I have told you. Will you write about him, a poem? Perhaps glancing at my poems or reviewing Hungarian had prompted this commission, this charge. I should do something to honor the man they'd nicknamed Gunga Din for his service as a water carrier to the Jews at slave labor. With others, my father had hoisted scrap into the maw of the factory's smelter, broken rails, locomotive wheels, engine casings thrown into a cauldron of fire, a circle of heat almost unbearable. It was like a scene from Dante, though I'd heard the story many times before I even knew who Dante was. I heard the first telling as an 11-year-old when I accompanied my parents to a grown-up dinner at a lawyer's house, a house so big our entire one-room uh, bedroom apartment would have fit into its minimalist open-plan first floor with its white walls and paintings. I was its incidental audience, hearing it at a distance as I sat on a sofa with a book at the audible corner, uh, at the audible border, but listening hard. Dad knew better than to speak to me directly then anyway. I was a seething fumarole of resentments, iced over in irony when I could muster it. I counted on him missing my faint sarcasm, a ploy dangerous with a European father who was as heavy-handed as any on our block, these men with accents who shouted from windows or stoops and were apt to descend to the street and smack their kids around for various reasons. My father sometimes lost himself entirely to anger. It felt as though anything could happen to someone caught in the midst, someone who caused and therefore deserved the anger. Something must have been deeply wrong with a child who required such force in response, but it wasn't the episodes of anger alone that fueled resentment. After all his absences for so many night school nights came his starring presences as on that visit, his stories, only his story in our closed narrative economy all the space for story taken up as he recounted his narrow passage to survival with the charm that I thought of as deception, believing I had seen his truest face in rage. He'd been lucky, that's all, he said to the two other couples there. He waggled his head as he said this, signifying a modesty that suddenly looked out of place, a familiar gesture of his that seemed properly to belong to the countrymen of Gunga Din, though not the one he was talking about. So when he spoke on that evening to those people about his virtuous Gunga Din, I looked for what he meant in other than what he said, the early stages of the habit. Part of his luck was knowing Gunga Din, to whom he remained ever grateful, the water carrier who never rested, never walked, ran always, bringing water to those my father called brothers. Gunga Din only ever paused to wait as they fed the smelter, standing by as they lifted together great rafts of steel checker plate, large sections of discarded machinery, heavy weights of metal into the molten roiling. Anyone's momentary slackening, anyone's stumble might, meet a dead, might mean a deadfall of iron on everyone. And Gunga Din was at hand always, offering the filled ladle to each, tenderly, as if it were, in my father's description, a meal he had especially prepared for each. I visualized a tiny man, always in a stooped scurry, hunched over, yoked like an ox, buckets hung on either side, ferrying from the pump into the hot exhalations of the hell's mouth smelter, and then back again. I heard the story many times over the years, and I came to see Gunga Din as someone who allowed himself to be an incidental figure in someone else's story, other to the others, likely even a simpleton given his frantic motion, even in his service, a water boy in the company of men. 
They had the harder work, no matter how hard he'd made his own. They formed the brotherhood under the pressure of the most difficult and dangerous job. He must have stood outside the group, the boy beside those more manly, those who were closer to the fire. When my dad asked me that day in New York to write a poem, I wanted to ask about the nickname. How close a comparison to the hero of Kipling's poem did the men who gave the name intend? I had seen, as they must have, the silly 1939 film inflated out of the poem. The homely pockmarked Jew, Sam Jaffe, his surname means pretty in Hebrew, played some kind of approximate Indian. Was he a Sikh in that turban? Of course, Jews often played the other, including Native Americans, cavalry fodder in Westerns. No doubt many Jewish actors were in the verminous swarm of attackers that hurled themselves at the fort uh, the British heroes defended. Their faces were other, and being other, they could be any kind of other. So wasn't this man other to them, the Jews at the smelter? They, they, uh, they could give him a name besides his own. What was his real name, I asked my father. He hesitated a little. I don't know. You forgot? We always called him Gunga Din. What language did you speak with him? I thought maybe they spoke Yiddish, Mamaloshin, the mother tongue. Oh, Hungarian. And did you talk to him much? My father seemed a little distant for a moment. He had a family, a wife, children. The nickname must have been a sort of joke. They laughed at him, right? No, 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 my father said, drawing himself up and back in his chair, looking at me with surprise. We loved him. And in that moment that I believed him, I saw what he meant for me to see, a whole world beyond irony, full of unintricate acts and love there as simple as slaked thirst. I told him I would try and write the poem. So my question was then, and did you write the poem? I, I you did. Then sent me. <laughs> yes, Thank I you. did. No answer like that answer. Yeah. You know, you talked a lot about having to do research and uh, probably learning a lot about train tracks and bridges oh, and yes. routes. Not to mention the overall Holocaust history for context. This is a very personal memoir but it required scholarly research for you to set the characters within. Is there a sort of a push and a pull between sort of a more academic approach or a more scholarly approach or a historical approach as opposed to this, which is so very personal? Mm. I, you know, you write, you wrote a poem about Mengele and your good friend David Mar Marwell wrote a scholarly book. And, uh, you know, you studied a great deal about the Holocaust in Hungary. Um, probably quite different than the scholar we usually go to whose name starts with a B. Oh, yeah. And I'm blanking. Yeah, but, right. But a, a scholar. I'll, I'll, so, s I'll see you that blank and I'll raise you a blank. So if you could talk about that. Um, Brahmin. Ralph, is it? Bra Brahman Brahman. is his, his yes. last name, Brahman. Um, in one sense, there's a, a kind of cooperative relationship between the, the superstructure of history and the, in, in, and the, and the very personal. Um, one of the things I conceived of with the historical background that my, my uh, father and my aunt and uncle didn't necessarily know was that if I asked them for their memories, I could give them something in return where their small story fit into a, a much larger one. And in that way, there wasn't tension. I was, it, it, though my expectation of when I gave them the larger history, what their response was, would be was always a surprise to me in the end. Uh, I was, in fact, able to tell my Aunt Lily, who had had several encounters with Mengele, um, I was able to tell her what happened to him later courtesy of David Marwell, for one, for one thing. Um, and my expectation was that she would be satisfied because there was some humili humiliation for him at the end and, you know, in, in, in his history. Um, but she, she did not respond that way. The, the, the predict uh, anybody's response to anything, but a survivor's in particular to, to other histories 
is, you know, it's a, it's a, losing, it's a losing game. But so there was, there was, uh, there was a push me, pull you that worked out well in certain ways. If, my, if I could tell my father that, that, you know, what you did, my father, he was liberated by the Russians and uh, eventually unwillingly served in the Russian army as a translator. Um, but I was able to tell him what happened around him in ways that he wasn't aware of, that he was interested in. So there was that. Um, and there were other times when I think my obsession with, with the truths um, was an obsession with getting it right. Um, anything associated with the Holocaust and Holocaust uh, memory and testimony and history, I feel if I make a mistake, it allows the devil in. And the devil in the form of actual human beings who look for reasons to deny that the Holocaust existed or that it, was, it wasn't all that bad or, you, you know. Um, so I, I get very concerned with having a larger structure of history to put the individual testimony into. So I have another question or two and then we'll open up for your questions. Uh, uh, you talked, Rabbi Talvi, about the uh, anti-Semitism project. I think we can probably link the Holocaust to anti-Semitism. I suppose. I think. But more specifically, there's an incident where uh, you're in Auschwitz, and oh, they're no. talking about it's not kept up, and they really could use money, and the man suggests. Uh, it was uh, an American guy from Chicago, I think, who was, the, to, do, to be fair to him, he was with a rather sullen teenage son whom he'd brought to Auschwitz, like the worst, worst place on earth. Um, or, you know, one of the candidates for the worst place on earth. And, uh, but he, he said to us, do you know the place? And my father said, yes, I nearly, I nearly ended up here. And, um, and he said, look at it, it's falling down. You know, it's the Poles that are responsible for it, and the Poles don't have any money. The Jews should support this place, you know. And my 78-year-old father, I had to hold him back. I thought he was going <laughs> I thought we were gonna get into a fist fight. In, uh, in Auschwitz, and I was able to steer him off, you know. So, were there other examples during your travels um, that you encountered anti-Semitism? Not in my travels. What immediately came to mind was something that, that um, you know, when I, when I think of my own experience as a Jew in the Bronx, um, I'm, I was aware of very early, I had never heard the names for Jews, you know, Sheeny and, and you know, Kike and all that. And I was instructed by my Irish uh, neighbors. <laughs> I was going to call them friends, but they weren't friends till later, some of them. Um, it, it was, we were alive to the experience of anti-Semitism, of course, because of my father's story, but it was to be had in, you know, domestic circumstances less extreme. And my, my father's experience himself of anti-Semitism was, began with the peasant ki kids around Munkach, and he w was born uh, in a village outside of the town of Munkach, which is now in, <laughs> in Ukraine. Um, and they were anti-Semitic kids, and they eventually were throwing stones, and eventually, you know, they graduated uh, to other forms of anti-Semitism, more extreme. Um, but you know, I had, I, I had my own experiences, even though I was alert to it, particularly alert to it from a, a family that was alert to it. Yeah. So you, your father once asked, I think somewhat, probably rhetorically, why are we doing this? And your answer was, as a memorial to Shmuel. R right. And later you talk about other things you felt were accomplished. Looking back, why did you do this as a memorial to Shmuel? Did it yeah. say more about yeah. its intent and, that moment and in what the, it accomplished? That, that moment in the book is a moment I'm at sea, and we've just sung some songs, and from nowhere my father is choked up and says, why are we doing this? You know, And I gave the standard answer that he had given me, really. But I think now, looking back on it and speculating in the book about it, I think I did it to get closer to my father and get closer to an understanding of uh, what his life was uh, in some really much more intimate kind of a way. It's, 
once you're an audience for a story or expected to hear it to carry it on, um, you're, I'm part of the outcome of the story in a way. I'm the happy ending in a, in a peculiar kind of way, if that can be said to uh, exist uh, in a story like, Survivors like that. Survivors often say. Y yeah. Yeah, my father would having say. A, having a family is the. A triumph. Right. A triumph. But, but I, I think I, I wanted to break down some barriers uh, between my father and myself. The Holocaust brought us together in certain ways. I became this receptacle for story, but at the same time, it, it seemed so, a, a barrier, an experience that I couldn't understand. And I understood it somewhat better by being on the ground and also seeing at certain times my father in a less uh, controlled way. I mean, after a while, you tell the stories, you, in order to bear telling the stories, there becomes a kind of practice of telling, a practiced way of telling. And uh, we had some moments, not through planning, and I can't say I expected them, um, where I saw how raw that was and how permanently raw it would be. And I was there for it and able to be of some comfort though I'm, to this moment, I can't say I, I, I was for certain. <laughs> so you were searching for a bridge, but also bridges of memory, bridges of relationships. Bridges between my father right. and myself, yeah. If uh, there are questions, I know Shane has a microphone and is circulating. father's legacy um, and sharing his story. Um, I'm fascinated by this time frame and I would just love to learn more um, about how did, what was his ex the experience like when he was liberated by the Russians? Like what, what, what happened? Well, they nearly shot him. Um, there was that <laughs> because he was liberated. He was in hiding at that point um, and <laughs> Uh, they were Uzbek, Uzbek East troops. My father speaks a lot of language. He's alive, by the way, and, and well enough, though he's, his memory is, is not what it was. Um, and he can speak all kinds of languages, but Uzbeki, whatever they speak, wasn't one of them. Um, so it was, one of the, it was like a Jewish joke. The, the, um, the captain who was in charge of these troops happened to be Jewish. And um, he, was able, he was able to save the day in Yiddish. Um, and Uzbeki, of course. Um, but the Russians were down on men, and they were in the midst of um, a push that put them uh, f more head-to-head -head with uh, Hungarian troops. They needed somebody who could speak Hungarian. And my father was given the choice of uh, joining the Russian army, or if he wanted to, he could join the Russian army. So it was that kind of experience. And my father's experience in the Russian army was replete with anti-Semitism and also an experience of that army, the tradition of that army, which persists to this moment. Uh, I hope that, that, that answers your question. Anybody else? Because I got Dan here. He's got questions and questions. Rich. So, in some sense, Jason, I think um, you did a service for your father in this trip. And t to some extent, did you feel that service earned you the opportunity also to confront your father and uh, on the particulars of your own history with him? Can you say something about the mixture of those two activities? Yes. I mean, I felt like all along the way, I think, as I grew up and heard these stories and, and I want to say paid a price for hearing them and, and knowing him, you, you know, uh, with um, the damage that he'd experienced. Um, and the trip to being on the very same ground as some th the, the things that he told me about that had happened, I, was, I felt empowered to ask him some questions that I could not have asked him 
otherwise. Uh, because that, first of all, I, I could see things I, I couldn't see. Um, and and um, just in landscape alone, kind of. It's, it's hard to explain, but being on the ground did feel like license in, in some way. I mean, there was a certain amount of, um, I can't call it suffering, but effort put out that, that made me feel entitled to probe more. Though I have to say, not proudly, that I, I probed sometimes, you, you know. And I, I meant to learn myself, and I also meant um, to challenge. But I did feel, you know, more licensed to do so uh, on, on the trip. And more licensed to, you know, to hold us both to, to exactness in some way. To find the spot, to know where we were and what had happened. I think along those lines it makes me wonder, um, sometimes you, you read a lot of the Holocaust literature, even the poetry, and you feel shame, you know, this kind of shame up from the survivors. But I don't sense that in this story, the shame. And then the second thing I I'm wonder about also following on these questions is, you know, we talk a lot today about inherited trauma. And I wonder if this experience kind of gave you the insight into that inherited trauma so that you don't have to pass it on. I, you know, I can't, you'll have to interview my children <laughs> for <will>. that. <laughs> yeah, shame doesn't seem a big part of my father's experience, but in part because he, my father doesn't admit he's forgotten anything at this moment, and, and he'll come into a room after, if, if, on a visit, and he'll be surprised to see me after having just left the room and come back, you know. You know. Um, denial, <laughs> the, the longest river in the world goes the joke, you, you know. Um, he, if he were ashamed of, of anything that he'd done, he certainly didn't speak of it. And, and he spoke with some pride of, and I believed him, and I believe him, that he'd never taken bread from anybody, that he'd never done anything to be ashamed of. And I, I, I think he's that sort of guy, I have to say. Um, and he believed in, a, in almost a naive way, I feel, in, in honor. <laughs> Um, and he had a notion that uh, he was very poor and, and uneducated, and he admired people, the people in labor camp that he did better than because he'd, he'd lived with far fewer calories all his life. But he, he so admired the people who had education, and Jewish education in particular, uh, and secular education. These are things that he wanted, and he wanted to be seen by people he was with as someone who was honorable, aspired for the, to the right things and was morally straight. And I think he was. That's sort of uh, what you said about admiring educated. It reminds me of the incidents with Imre, yes. which was another example of he saw it one way and he experienced it, but it could also have been viewed in other ways, if you want to say a little bit about that. Yeah, Imre was uh, a, a guy he admired uh, and uh, encountered in the first camp, I think he was in. They, they, they traveled together. Um, and Imre was educated and um, assimilated, a thoroughly assimilated uh, Hungarian Jew. And he was the person who had connections outside the second labor camp that uh, were going to assure that my father's escape with Imre would uh, succeed. There was a, a professor, a blind professor, who had room in his house for some, some uh, people. And um, the Chepel camp was close enough to get into Budapest. Um, if you didn't get caught, you, you could at least get into the city where you could get readily turned in. But if you had some place to, to go, um, but somehow, uh, in the escape, the escape went off all right, but Imre no longer had a space for him. 
And I, was, I often wondered whether my father admired Imre more than Imre admired him, because after the war, he, the, he sought Imre out, but uh, Imre never sought him out. He, you know, it's almost like trying to apply the ordinary um, ideas of relationship. You know, somebody likes somebody more than they like you know, their, their affection is returned. And in, in an ordinary circumstance, that's, you know, a, a speculation that's social in some way. Here, survival depends on it. And I always felt, I felt differently when I was presented with the facts of Imre than I, than I thought my, than I thought the con conclusion about Imre that my naive father had, had drawn, uh, it was, we, were, we just viewed that differently. I thought he was wrong about him, right? I mean, how can I say that? It's ridiculous, re really. And yet, I, that's what I suspected, that there was some little thing that allowed this fellow, my father, poor, uneducated, naive, to be excluded. I want to remind the audience watching at home that if you uh, have any questions, we are ready for those as well. So if you need a audio reminder that you too can type in a question because we can uh, ask those here in the next couple of minutes, but we'll go over here. Hello. Hey okay. there. So I know you said that, you know, when it came with the, to, to, a subject came up and your father would say, write a poem about it. You know, was there a point where your dad said, let's write a book about this? And I wonder how much kind of say he had or, or push he had or, you know, did you kind of read and discuss things? And I know these are deeply personal stories, so I don't know if these were like, there are some things that were too personal to put in, you know, how did that work? Um, I, I didn't check with him about anything. Um, I, I became good at that along the way, yeah. but, now my, but now my father doesn't, he can't read anymore. Uh -huh. He still has all his languages. He's still a, an absolute pain in the neck to walk down the street with him because he eavesdrops and talks to everybody in, you know, anything from, you can name it, you know. Even on this trip, I, I was under the impression that Polish was not one of his languages, and he's yammering away in Polish. And, you know, I, I figure we can count this. You know, maybe it's 11 and not 10, you know. <laughs> it was a matter of you've told his story all along, so this is... Yeah, yes, though, what's under contention in the book is, is the stories that disappear, that he's told for a while that somehow he, he won't tell anymore. And uh, I interrogate that a, a lot. Um, you know, I ask him about that. Th those are some of the things I ask him about, on, on the spot, so to speak. Um, yeah, but I, I, I wasn't subject to censure. I, but I, I will tell you flat out that, that if my father were reading and, and fully aware I'm not sure I could have written this book. It feels even now a little bit like, I don't know, telling tales at a school or, or what's, what's a more extreme version of that? Betrayal, I think, is the word that's, that springs to mind. Um, a, a, a transgressive quality of literature. You know, I, I, it's tough to, to, to air these things, out, but I'm airing them for myself and, and working them out Oddly enough, when you're writing a book like this, as personal as it is, you don't think of people reading it. <laughs> I mean, you make the sentence at a time, you know, um, as clear as you can, but yeah. <laughs> Your father wrote his own memoir. He, he has a privately published uh, memoir, yeah, yeah. And I, I think we're, we're, yeah, it's a different sort of memoir, <laughs> you know, than mine. Um, he came to me once when he was writing and said, he said, look at this page. And he had the word firmament in it. And I said, no, we don't do firmament anymore, Dad. We do sky, you know. That'll do. Yeah. Um, we have one I, question online. Of, uh, Austin wants to know, how did your father make it to America? Yeah, that, there, everything's a story, you know. <laughs> Um, he was in DP camp, displaced persons camp for um, almost three years and desperate. And the DPs were finding ways of, uh, of filing for papers from, you know, dead people were applying for, 
papers and, and the papers came through in various uh, orders and people attached themselves to papers who, that had nothing to do with them, you know, any way of getting out of the camp. My father's story was, you know, there was a quota against um, Eastern European Jews after, after the war. Um, <laughs> striking, after everything's out about the camps, still uh, refugees weren't allowed into the, into the country. Um, well, s someone had applied under the name Summer, a um, uh, German Jew. I don't know whether that Jew was still in the camp, and I don't know whether the person that got the papers was Summer, but he got two sets by accident. And he was walking, my father happened onto him at, at, in, in, in the camp in Cremona, and the guy said, wow, well, I've got two sets of papers. <laughs> and my father said, oh. <laughs> I think I know what we can do with one set of those papers. I didn't even know this. I guess I've heard this story only in the last five years or something. My father was always afraid he would, the authorities would come to the door and cart him off. You, you know, uh, even after national prominence, he was National Teacher of the Year in 1981. Um, so my father, my father's something, you know. Uh, not just the languages, but coming here with an, less than an elementary, a complete elementary school education and getting himself several master's degrees and all but dissertation um, in Russian literature. Yeah. Uh, Is there a hand? Last question. <laughs> I, w I was curious about your mother, you mentioned her, her deference to the story, and does that come up in the book, and uh, is, is there an evolution to that process? Is it, how much intention was it, or did it just, everybody sank into the roles? I think, I think there wasn't, a, she's important in the book, um, but she assumed that role of, of witness to the witness, you know, the witness to the person who'd experienced it, and and I don't think ever really moved out of it, um, and was uh, there's a wonderful for me anyway uh, interview, right? Uh, uh, the Spielberg Foundation did it, did a, these sets of interviews with survivors, and my father's has a testimony there, and and my mother is comes in at the end, and and she offers. She just talks about my father as a representative Jewish story, in addition to being, you know, personally somebody she knew well, um, and <laughs> and cracked the whip with every now and then. Um, and she she's a very strong character, my my mother. But a lot of that strength was applied to uh, allowing my father to work out um, what he had to work out after the war and and to tell the story. And in that interview, she specifically talks about suffering and triumph. He triumphs over it. Right. And, and for her, that's the sense of, the Jewish of a, Jewish, a Jewish story. Suffering and, and learning from that suffering. Um, and then, then doing something worthy. My father had many opportunities to do other things than teach including opportunities that were way more remunerative, I can't say it right now, right now. more money, and, and refused them every time in favor of, of teaching. Any closing words you'd like to say? No, thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Talvi, and, and Dan, of course, thank you so much, Dan Rich. Thank you for asking. Um, Let's have another round of applause. I want to thank everyone for it's coming out tonight. As a reminder, we do have Jeez, copies available for sale out here in the lobby that Jason will be Pardon. happy to I sign also in the lobby. Uh, for our online viewers, no, if kid. you uh, would love to order a signed copy, they're available at left-bank.com. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We'll go back and sign some. Yes. Dan? Come on.